Welcome to the Global Discussion, a discussion with creatives, leaders and thinkers. My name is Simon Hodgkins. Today, a real pleasure to be joined by Anna Cleary. Anna, you're very welcome to the show. Let's begin by asking you maybe to introduce yourself to our audience and tell us a little bit about your world, particularly this fascinating world of AI. So over to you, Anna. Thank you so much, Simon. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me onto the show. Um, so I'm Anna Cleary, as you said. Uh, I'm Irish, but I've lived probably most, more than half of my life in various international countries. Um, I work with a mainly in the B2B marketing sector, uh, primarily in the tech sector for more than 20 years. Um, currently, I work with a company called Software AG. Software AG, for anyone who doesn't know, is a um, B2B software company, second largest in Germany after SAP. Um, things are changing a little bit at the company as we had a big acquisition from IBM um, at the begin that closed at the beginning of this year. So since then, I've uh, diversified a little bit and uh, started really getting interested in AI marketing and offer consulting and services around that um, as a second um, a second income stream. No, it, and it's great that you share that because that, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. So just going back to Software AG, if I can, for a second. Software AG, for our worldwide audience listening, they're, they're a big name and very well respected in terms of the work that they do. I mean, it's everything from app and data integration, isn't it, to, you know, fully blown enterprise applications, business process management, uh, portfolio management, and of course, IoT. So your work there, I'm sure, is very expansive. But the question I've got for you is this move to AI, because you've also not only uh, started doing more work in the AI space, but you were also recognized as a top voice on LinkedIn, weren't you? How did that come about? Yes, um, thank you. I, uh, I Once I started getting busy with AI and I realized the impact it has on my own role at Software AG, which is really a very cross-functional role, managing global marketing campaigns and programs for each of the different business units, um, I realized that my role would never be the same again. So in terms of content creation, in terms of campaign planning, um, data and analysis, um, and really mapping out content matrix matrices across each of these different business units and functional areas, um, I, I started getting more and more interested in how AI was shaping how businesses operate, particularly how they go to market. And uh, I did a number of courses. I, I spent hours researching. I couldn't sleep literally for two nights at the beginning of my journey. My brain wouldn't shut off. There were just oh, you know, ideas firing 24 seven. And I started uh, posting about it on LinkedIn and uh, sharing with other influencers and thought leaders in the space. And um, as a result of that, then I was uh, and I'm recognized as one of the top voices on LinkedIn. Well, congratulations, because it, it is wonderful because you have that sort of moniker now that you are a top artificial AI voice official on LinkedIn. So it's great to see that. And I know you do an awful lot of uh, content and discussions around that space. But I also want to come back to something you said there, which is um, AI's impact. And AI is impacting us, not just on a personal level in terms of the activities that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, but it is also disrupting enterprise level companies such as the one that you're, you know, you, you've discussed here today. Um, but from your vantage point and from your understanding of AI, how much disruption is going on in the enterprise space? Is it as big as we think? Because we go from, it's fantastic, look at all the things we can do with it, to oh my goodness, what does this mean for jobs? What's your perspective on where we're at with AI, Anna? That's a great question, uh, Simon. So um, I think we're really at the beginning. Um, I think people are still getting their heads around what is possible. 
And it's very difficult because it's changing and moving so fast. So even for someone like myself, who's deeply involved in the topic, I have a sense of FOMO because it's very hard to keep up with the, the updates and the uh, announcements and new, new releases of various different products. I think there's, I read somewhere like hundreds, tens of thousands of products being released per week, like whether they're classified as GPTs or small little um, AI apps, uh, I'm not sure. But from an enterprise level, a company like Software AG finds it very difficult actually to embrace something that's moving that fast internally because it has such a significant impact on the processes that there's, and I've, I've witnessed this, there's a kind of paralysis you know, because the legal teams have to get on board. You have enterprise architects that need to look at it. You have uh, data protection officers. And if they're not up to date on the impact this has, what the code of conduct should be for employees, what the security implications are, you know, how is this giant power tool going to be used by people responsibly, ethically? then there's a tendency to really just slam on the brakes and not do it at all. And what that leads to is people, individuals and companies whose jobs uh, depend on that or who see you know, the impact that it has using it themselves. So you have almost like a shadow IT in a way where individuals are using it to um, you know, realize the product, immense productivity gains uh, that, that you can from using AI. Yeah, no, thank you for the insights. And it, it is interesting because whether you're the biggest company on the planet or whether you are a, a solo entrepreneur, AI is having a remarkable impact, not just in content creation, but also in uh, business processes in terms of how businesses operate today. And I think it's it's, it's a fascinating conversation because um, it leaves very little untouched, particularly in a B2B environment. Um, with your experience, you know, you, you've you've 20 odd years of working in enterprise and working across uh, multiple sectors, but is this AI wave that we're seeing now? Uh, I'm thinking of the Gartner hype cycle, you know, whether we're on the, the up, whether we're at the peak, whether we're down in this trough of disillusionment. Where do you think we're at now when it comes to the AI hype cycle? You mentioned earlier, you still think we're early, right? I still think we're very early, really. I don't see it as, as a wave um, in the sense that we're going to cycle through this the way we would other market trends that Gartner tracks. This is in my mind of the magnitude of, you know, when the internet became available or when mobile phones became available. So it, it's, it's possibly even greater than that. Um, and I think, you know, there are a lot of people who who, who feel they're in the trough of disillusionment. My advice would be, you know, really spend more time understanding the tools and what uh, they can do before, you know, dismissing them as being non-productive or, or, or not, you know, producing the right output. Um, often that's what I find with people who are a bit disillusioned with AI. It's they haven't learned to use it the right way. Or they're overwhelmed with the complexity. So, you know, and that's where I think starting with a, a small use case or two, identifying them and rolling them out successfully, and then expanding from there is, is always a good approach. Well, thank you, Anna. And on that note, um, you said something there that really resonated with me, which is, you know, people may not have learned how to use it properly yet. Um, and of course, the way we use it maybe is changing uh, as well as the technology continues to grow. But this fire hose, maybe if I can use that term of information, this fire hose of AI, whether it's GPTs that are being created all the time, at the time of recording, Microsoft have just launched their new uh, AI infused laptops we also have chat gpt launching 4.0 um uh, omnimodal i think it is um so it, it is changing at such a rapid pace have you got any advice for people in terms of 
how do you keep abreast of all this? I mean, how do you as an AI, you know, top influential voice in AI, how are you trying to keep on top of this? Because it's not easy, is it? No, it's definitely not, Simon. Um, but I would still encourage people not to, you know, wait on the sidelines until there's a good moment. And because, you know, what, what exists today will be replaced maybe in six months time. You're going to miss out on a whole lot of learning and understanding of how to use these things if you do that. And I see a lot of people doing that, you know, waiting, observing from the sidelines. My advice is really start experimenting, get involved. And you need an understanding, a kind of a foundational understanding to begin with, to un, you know, to, to interact and engage with the tools the right way, to get the most out of them. So my advice, Simon, to people is, you know, to really just start experimenting with the tools it is moving so fast that there is a danger that people wait on the sidelines and observe because they think what's available today will be replaced six months down the line anyway so why invest that time now if it's going to be superseded by something new um, however you do miss out on a lot of learning if you take that approach and understanding how the tools work and it's like in the it space you know it layers so it's not that something new comes in and necessarily makes what we have today obsolete. There's a layering of sophistication that happens quite a lot of the time. And I think, you know, what a lot of creators in the space are doing now is really getting, um, making various tools talk to each other. So automation is a big topic in the AI space. Um, and you can, anyone can really make two applications, for example, talk to each other without having any experience of code. Um, so that's just one example of, of what, what is uh, where AI is going. I think to stay on top of it, there are, my advice would be follow some creators on YouTube or LinkedIn. There's a lot of people sharing incredible value and learning. There's a real sense of community out there. Um, also, there are some free events yesterday, the, the world's largest free AI conference kicked off. Um, there, there, you know, there are definitely tons of educational tools that people can get busy with. Um, don't drink from the fire hose, like you said. I mean, you can only have so many AI newsletters in your inbox before you get, you know, a sense of overwhelming uh, information overload. So be picky, be choosy. Um, and then apply what you're learning. I think if you don't go and replicate it or apply it yourself, it's gone. And then you're it's you know you're swept up in the next the next thing that that that's announced. So um, yeah, that, that would be some of my that's that's great advice. Thanks, Anna. And I think you're right. I mean, the the fire holes, it it just it's nonstop. The amount of information hitting us is nonstop around AI. And to your point. You know, I often find myself there's so much out there and, you know, whether it's humans writing about AI or AI writing about AI, we're all reading the same sort of content. But I think the essence of what you're saying there, be picky, be choosy, find some good sources, connect with some good people, uh, because there is some really, really good knowledge out there. But sometimes maybe you just got to scratch below the the surface, you know, the sort of noise that's out there. But thank you for sharing that. And it leads me nicely onto another thing I want to ask you uh, from your AI vantage point, which is we talk a lot these days about having a human in the loop. AI is good. There's bias, there's hallucinations. Everybody talks about that. And then there's this sort of, you know, saying or comment, which is along the lines of, you know, there are people that will lose their role to AI and there are people that will know how to use AI and actually benefit from it. But we've seen some demonstrations recently, again, at the time of recording, where AI is talking to AI, code is talking to code. It's getting better at sort of removing that human from the loop. What's your viewpoint on the importance of having an, a, a human in the loop when it comes to whether it's enterprise level B2B applications um, or, or anything else for that matter? Um, because at the moment, AI seems to be great but you better have somebody checking it. I'm just, you know, to keep it at a simplistic level. But as we move closer to better and better models, as we train the data more and more, and maybe one day we reach AGI as opposed to generative AI, 
it seems as though the human could be moving to very different roles than what we do today. What do you view yeah, on that? I, I, I agree with you. I agree. Today, um, a human is definitely necessary in most functions. There are some things like data analysis, data transfer and things where you don't need it. Um, if it's in a, a walled garden, for example. Um, but in my role, I, I spend a lot of time developing custom GPTs for myself to, you know, save 75, 80% of time in certain tasks and also for clients because it helps small businesses act like large businesses, puts them on a par and um, it also gives large businesses a lot more agility to scale and really um, ramp up content engines or repurpose content in a way that they maybe couldn't before because they didn't have the resources. Um, nevertheless, you still need you know, it'll get you 80% of the way there, I usually say as a benchmark. You still need someone going over it at the end, even if you're, uh, you know, using very refined mega prompts. The fact is, ChatGPT, for example, it, it doesn't always get it right. It has quite a bit of recency bias in there as well. So it'll pay more attention to the thing that you said last. Even if you have custom permanent instructions in there, it doesn't always adhere. So you have to remind it sometimes to, you know, not use a list of words. I have a very long list of banned words because they're kind of telltale signs that this was produced by uh, AI if you're writing copy for, for some marketing piece. Um, and sometimes you have to be, you know, firm and adamant and go, no, go back, remind yourself of the instructions and then regenerate for me. Um, so I think today, definitely, humans are, are required looking into the future more, Simon. I'm not sure. It's, I, I, I think humans will definitely have different roles. We will have different roles. The AI is only going to improve. And if you listen to Jensen from NVIDIA and the, the computational power that's being developed, and where that's going to lead us, then um, yeah, it's as far as your ma imagination can can take you, I think. Yeah, I, I love what you said there. And I think whether it's the CEO of NVIDIA talking, whether it is uh, Satya Nadella from Microsoft, it's all about the, co the compute power that's enabling a lot of this. And that's only continuing to expand and grow. Um, and I also... Uh, really like what you said as well, um, because we we don't really know where, where we're going to end up. But one thing's for sure is the roles are certainly changing, aren't they? They are certainly changing. And I think that the best defense to anyone listening who may be fearful of their job being replaced is to understand it. Try and understand AI tools and, and the, the ones that are applicable to your role and your industry. We're getting more sophisticated. There are more industry specific tools coming out, whether it's for legal, um, it's a big area or for investing or you know whatever it is, they're getting more specialized. Understand the tools that are in your space and be one of the players, one of the creators that can operate those tools because you can extract incredible value and benefit if, if you know how. And going back again, if I can, to something that you touched on there, which was, you know, maybe a lot of your time you're, you're setting up GPTs to do specific tasks, to do specific things. I had a wry smile when you talked about the don't use these words, this sort of list, and you have to continually remind the GPT not to do that because consistency and memory still seems to be something that, that eludes us when it comes to working with these large language models and these GPTs. But a lot of people today... I think are using, I could be wrong here because there there's an awful lot. There are thousands and thousands of GPTs being created, right? There's GPT store, et cetera. But I think the vast majority of people are using it as a surface level and they're not creating those dedicated GPTs to do particular function. And you said, look, you know, save me 75% of time here or save me more time over here or to do something. Can you just maybe expand a little bit about that kind of world? Because some people are streets ahead when it comes to creating their own GPTs to really enhance their efficiency, 
their productivity, to cut down on the process time. And I know you're involved in that world. Could you maybe just, for our audience that maybe isn't creating their own GPTs at the moment, they're just using chat GPT or, or some other type of sure. uh, AI model, but they're not actually into that space of how do I create something purpose-built for me that helps me do something better, more efficient? Yeah, absolutely. So um, first thing to understand is to create GPTs, you, you need the paid version. So that function isn't open to anyone who has just got the freemium version. However, with GPT-4.0, you can access the library of GPTs that people have published for general use. And to be honest, Simon, there's a, there's a lot of garbage in there, you know. <laughs> It's really people experimenting, right? Throwing up anything and, and learning as they go. Um, what How I use custom GPTs is I basically set up a custom GPT. Let's take it for one client, right? Break it into marketing functions. So it could be um, LinkedIn post copy creation. It could be social media ad creation for various different channels. It could be blog writing, newsletter writing, um, hook copyright idea. It could be data analysis. It could be um, SEO competitor gap analysis. It could be uh, SWOT analysis, event promotion plans. I mean, ChatGPT is incredible at putting together plans for things. It may be better than it's by in my opinion, the, the far best tool out there for that type of work. Um, whereas it does have competition when it comes to creative copywriting from Gemini and, and a couple of others. Um, but I basically set up a custom GPT for all the marketing functions that are going to create together a content engine. And what I discovered is it's very important if you want to scale this library of custom GPTs to separate out what I call the ICP. So anyone in marketing would, would understand ICP stands for ideal customer profile. So let's say you're a business and you're targeting three different personas in your ideal customer profile. These are three different types of people or groups of buyers that typically buy from you. And you may have three different go-to-market strategies around them. So I would develop a custom GPT for each of them. And the beauty of custom GPTs is that, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm talking with my social media ad GPT. I can chain link or call in my ICP for one of my go-to markets and say, okay, what do you think of the output I've just generated? Is this going to motivate you to buy? is what objections would you have if you read this copy? How would you advise me to change this and optimize it so that it you know, performs better in your eyes? So it's really having I, a GPT set up that you can role play with. They're like your digital customer who's always with you whenever you want to you know, bounce anything off them or get feedback from. And I think when you start understanding the world of custom GPTs that can be chain linked together, they act as one brain essentially. So now you have the whole marketing function that you can essentially set up as a linear process almost to start from idea creation to copywriting to um, repurposing for various different outputs, resizing, the list goes on. <laughs> so it, it, I, I think it's an incredible uh, way for especially small, medium, or resource-strapped companies to act on, on a much larger scale than they actually were. It democratizes a lot of things for, for companies. Very insightful. I love those AI marketing sort of tips. I, I often hear about people referring to GPTs as sort of their virtual assistant or their junior copywriter. But I think what you're describing there is almost having a customer sandbox where you can get them to critique and tell whether they think this is going to work and how do you make it better. And just using the GPT as the customer persona, I think, is a very interesting take on that. So thank you for sharing that insight. Um, uh, a couple of questions just as we move on here that for people that are trying to get into AI, you've talked a little bit about learning. You've talked a little bit about these GPTs. 
But is there any sort of more general advice or what advice do you find yourself in your sort of AI marketing role? What's, what sort of advice do you often find yourself sharing with people, Anna? Um, I think the first thing I usually tell people, Simon, because I know I went through it myself, is don't try and boil the ocean. Don't try and understand everything. Like there are so many tools for AI video creation. There's a whole swath of tools now for AI audio. There's, you know, many more for avatars, for text, for, you know, you could, you'll be spun around if you try and really grasp and, and run after every new shiny object, right? It's a real syndrome. <laughs> um, focus on a use case, focus on an area, maybe you look at two or three tools, select the one that you think is going to be best for your use case and nail that. Get a process in place that you're happy with and then move on to the next. Because otherwise, really, you'll end up, you know, there's an opportunity cost in chasing every new thing that comes out. You're not actually mastering or changing your business process with the tools that are there. So put a stake in the ground saying, this is what I'm going to do learning this and implementing this and you know i'll revisit maybe this area in four to six months and then look and see rather than trying to keep up from you know week to week or month to month because you're just chasing chasing time and that's much faster than you <laughs> yeah I, I love it and i the two things there that stuck with me is you know you don't have to try and boil the ocean because it can feel like that sometimes with the amount of information coming at us um, and I think that's that's really, really important. But also, as well as sort of not trying to boil the ocean, that opportunity cost, um, I don't think we consider that enough as people. I think, you know, we often look at the cost of something uh, or, you know, we get excited about something, the next shiny thing, but we don't necessarily consider that opportunity cost at the time. Uh, that we should. And I think that's really, really insightful. So thanks, Anna. Yeah, I think that's that's critical, especially for people who haven't embraced it at all, right? Who really haven't started yet. And they know it's important because they hear it in the fringes. Um, but they're the ones that are in danger of, you know, having their lunch eaten in short order if they don't start embracing and adopting. Like I work with some agencies in the video marketing and communication space they see what AI tools are capable of. They are already starting to see, you know, small video editing jobs just drying up and are wondering, you know, how can they reposition themselves? How can they adopt these tools to provide new services and, and even products that will make sure that they're, you know, future-proofing their business? Yeah, 100%. And one thing that I like to ask our guests here on the Global Discussion, Anna, is about the way they go about planning, what are they thinking about? What's on their roadmap? And as you, you're probably in the hottest topic on the on the planet right now, AI, the AI world. When you think about the next six, 12, 18 months, what are you actually thinking about? What's on your horizon? What's on your roadmap? What are you hoping to achieve? I would love to adopt more AI practices in software AG to help us become more proficient, more productive, more innovative, because that's what, uh, it, you know, the tools allow. So I hope that, um, you know, we, we, we actually get to roll those out because it is a large organization and there are hurdles and legitimate concerns by various different departments. Um, so that would be my goal at Software AG. And on a more personal note, I would like to grow my marketing, consulting, and services business. Um, there is, you know, huge interest and huge demand. I've started giving uh, AI marketing courses, so that's an area I enjoy as well. Just teaching people and enabling them to start their journey. I think it's an incredibly rewarding uh, way to be part of the space. Um, but I think. You know, there, there are, it, it's a little bit like the Wild West. I don't know if you feel this, Simon. The AI space is a little bit like the Wild West. People realize there's tremendous opportunity and we are at the cusp of something major. Um, there's, there's a lot of people just posting tons of content out there, but I think businesses if, have to be cautious about 
how they are applying it to their own business and not to just back to the shiny object syndrome. You need to have an understanding of how these things can be integrated in business processes. So not just start producing, you know, tons of content because you can or because the tools allow it, but do it in a way that's really going to accelerate your go-to-market um, or hyper-target on your ideal customer profile. So I think the combination of a business, good business marketing understanding and the AI tools um, is, is a powerful one. I couldn't agree more. I think navigating the Wild West is always a good thing. It reminded me as you were talking about that, that it's a bit like the gold rush, you know, there's the gold rush and everybody involved in it. Then there's the people selling the shovels and the spades, right? So there's a, it takes a little bit of both, a little bit of thinking. So I really do appreciate your comments there. And another thing that I wanted to touch on is with these GPTs and the ability now to upload images, for example, there are some interesting use cases, aren't there? Is there anything that springs to mind when I ask you that question? Um, there, ChatGPT has incredible image recognition and data analysis capabilities. So one use case uh, that I use quite often is with Google Analytics or marketing intent platforms. We use a lot of them at Software AG. Some of these can be quite complex with a lot of you know charts and analysis. Um, you can take a screenshot, upload it into ChatGPT, and ask it to summarize, highlight key um, key points, ask it to recommend next best actions, and even when it sees a URL, Simon, to transcribe the URL and go and research the information it finds on that website. So if, for example, you're looking at um, you know, Google Analytics and you're seeing URLs as a reference that come up as a traffic driver for you, you can ask, you know, okay, go and tell me what is that website and summarize you know, what key topics they're talking about. So it builds a much more comprehensive picture of your digital marketing footprint and what's going on without you having to be an expert in that area. I really love that, Anna, because it, it shows that, you know, you can take that image, upload it, it will give you a full analysis of it and those recommendations. And I know I can hear people as they're listening and watching to us talking here, they've immediately started to think about that. <laughs> and uh, th that will be the next thing they do, particularly for people that have those analytics dashboards, which just seem to go on forever um, to get another pair of eyes on it uh, and to give you key recommendations. Such a smart thing. Thanks for sharing that, Anna. My pleasure. I have two yeah. remaining questions I want to squeeze in, Anna. One is, before we wrap up today, is there anything else maybe that we haven't touched on or maybe something we have touched on that you want to double down on that you want to share and leave our worldwide audience with today? And the second question is, if people want to reach out and connect with you, find out more about all this great work you're doing in AI and AI marketing, where's the best place to send people to? Um, so maybe the, the, the first thing, you know, coming back to Wild West and everything, um, maybe it's a good cautionary, because um, I'm, I'm a big AI advocate, right? And there's great things that you can do, but it's on the, at the same time, for businesses, they really need to be aware of the type of data and information they're sharing. You know, do not share any sensitive information that you wouldn't want the model to be training on. Um, you know, a lot of the tools are op open source. Be mindful of that. You know, there are security concerns. So you can do a lot of great in-depth data analysis by anonymizing the information you're uploading and asking for assistance on. So it's not that you can't do stuff, but you can anonymize it and then, you know, rematch it up when you when you get the output. Um, so just to be mindful of that. And there there's there's a world, you know, AI is, it can be used for good. It can also be used for bad. So um, Software AG, for example, had three attempted very sophisticated fraud attacks two weeks ago 
where um, AI voice clones were impersonating the CEO trying to wrangle money out of the company. I've heard of several cases like that where you know there's digital avatars that look and sound and act exactly like a real person on screen. And it only takes three hours to train one of those digital avatars to you know be as convincing as you and I are here sitting. Uh, talking. So I think people, that's another reason for people to understand what's possible with the tools and to have some um, safeguards in place so that they don't get, you know, caught out um, or or manipulated in some way by uh, AI tools that are there. And if people want to get in touch, I think the best place is probably LinkedIn. I'm very happy um, for, you know, to, to exchange ideas, to answer any questions, um, to get in touch. Uh, my handle is Anna Cleary one so anyone can reach me there, and I'd love to connect. Well, that brings us lovely uh, to the end of our discussion here today. Uh, I want to, first of all, thank everybody who's been watching or listening to this episode of The Global Discussion. Make sure that you follow, like, subscribe, do everything I need you to do to help support the show. And uh, make sure that you join me back here for some more great discussions with creatives and leaders and thinkers, just like Anna. But thanks, Anna, for being a guest on The Global Discussion. It's been a real pleasure to catch up with you again today. Thank you so much for having me, Simon.